journey of design, but uh, to us uh, is uh, a journey and exploration. Journey and exploration, um, we look at it as synonymous almost. I mean, there's no, not a reason to even take a journey if you're not exploring, if you're not going somewhere that you haven't been before. So I love these images, and I use them as uh, inspiration, and I've had them for, for a long time. Um, the image on the left was taken by Jim Lovell, an astronaut uh, of the Apollo 8, uh, when, and also he was in the Apollo 11, uh, 13. So he went twice around the moon, never landed. But he took that famous picture of the first uh, moon rise, uh, Earth rise over the moon, and uh, a couple of months, I had the privilege of having dinner with him a couple of months ago, and uh, he extended his arm, and the, it was, his thumb was covering the earth, and uh, at that time, uh, he realized that everything he knew, everybody he, everybody he knew, fitted in his, under his thumb, and uh, realized that paradise was earth that we always look at the heavens and where, is, where are the heavens. And the heaven really is an earth. You know, how precious this sphere is. This is what Deva just went through, those incredible images of the earth. Um, and he remains today, actually, as the, being, the, the man that have, has been the furthest away from the earth. He has flown, he has been the most distant away on this high orbit around the moon, away from earth. So, and we haven't gone back since. The picture on the right, the photograph on, uh, on the right, is a great work from one of our greatest artists, American artist, or George O'Keefe. You know, to me, it, it, it's the piece of artwork that uh, serves as kind of this yearning that we have as humans, uh, no matter if it's technical or, or artistic, of exploring, of really going to space, of looking at the heavens. A little bit. Uh, about our background and my background uh, of how uh, I started my journey uh, and, and designing for space. I uh, grew up in Argentina, and about, when I was about 12 years old, I realized that I had to go explore the world. Uh, my bedroom was uh, the library of the house, and I had National Geographic, and you know, kind of focused me on, on the outer planet. And um, I landed in Houston, Texas, uh, uh, about a month before the landing on the moon. I came in a cargo ship, and uh, about I was living 30 miles away from the NASA Joseph Space Center. Uh, during about three years or so, I traveled to the JSC uh, many, many times, you know, fascinated by this whole thing about space, and figuring out a, a way how an architect could possibly work in this program. Um, and many doors were shut until one opened uh, when I got to do my undergraduate thesis and design this lunar base, uh, at that time a grandiose um, project to have about 200 people on the moon. We haven't had it yet. But um, at that time, I had the privilege of working with Bucky Fuller. Uh, Bucky actually helped me understand the pressures that these buildings were going to have. The great change on the moon is you know, that you, know, you don't have uh, the gravity and actually the atmosphere. Uh, I had the privilege of working on the space station. I spent more than a decade working on the space station uh, design, uh, and that took me to looking at uh, humans living in extreme environments, whether uh, here on Earth, uh, and particularly uh, the Antarctic base. Uh, we actually won a competition with some, a group of students of mine uh, for the master plan and design of the South Pole Station, and it took us there uh, really to uh, test some of the things that we were designing. And we also fly with Deva a lot on this Vomit Comet, this fantastic plate. <laughs> there you see us flying away, and uh, I do experiments for her, and she actually really tries to get me as sick as possible. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's really a, a, a fun, fun time uh, that we have <laughs> in this environment. Uh, Deva mentioned our circumnavigation. Mark mentioned it. Uh, uh, we call our lives uh, AC, uh, uh, DC, and AC before, before BC. I'm sorry, and AC after the circumnavigation, before and after the circumnavigation. Uh, really, really changed my life. Talking about an inner 
uh, an inner experience. I mean, it really, uh, I came back from this about 18 months living in the ocean, just the two of us, of which about 50% of the time truly were just the two of us uh, alone in the ocean, you know, without seeing land. Uh, so during those nine months, you do a lot of introspective thinking and exploring uh, not only the planet, we learn a lot about the oceans, we learn about you know, the atmosphere, climate, um, but more important, we learn about people. Uh, very much like uh, the trip uh, around the country on, on the Winnebago, we went around the world in this boat, and, and really it's about people. And uh, we did a teaching uh, mission where uh, we were the uh, um, global ambassadors of NASA at the time. Uh, and we contacted a lot of students, young students around the planet, to teach them about exploration, about space. And, um, and again, we had all fantastic workshops and communicated with them for many, many times, many, many years, actually, after, after the mission. And um, actually, NASA provided us astronauts uh, to contact with the students. So we would have these workshops where we had telecommunication, uh, video communication was very, very hard at the time. This was in 2001. And believe it or not, we didn't have Skype. And uh, we had to organize these videos with the astronauts from Houston uh, to the schools and then connected a third school in the United States to wherever we were to communicate between the three. So the astronauts would tell the story and then you know, we were there live with the students. It was really a, a fantastic uh, experience. So um, I come from a long family of architects. I'm fourth generation. My daughter is an architect. And uh, so I feel that with this space architecture, I kind of carrying this flag of, of the family tradition you know, forward into space, into exploring the universe. But the, the great uh, part about that journey is that it, it turned me into you know, really an industrial designer, uh, a vehicle designer, uh, really understanding science and technology. So space architecture really transformed you know, my life. Um, talking about the journey of design, you know, it's just kind of the design process. I'm not going to bore you to tears with this one, but <laughs> we, all, you, we all know it. And it's not very different than anybody else. But the key things that we do is actually we're a very small group, and we, we get together a, a team for every project. Every project is a different team. You know, I assemble people from all different aspects, you know, artists, uh, engineers, uh, scientists, you, you name it. And we're working uh, on a team. And it's just like any trip that you take, you know, the crew uh, that you take with you is essential to the success of the mission. And the success, and also to the happiness of the mission, and to really enjoy in this mission. So, uh, we really put a huge amount of emphasis in, in searching continually for the right kind of mix that we want and the personality that we want in the team. Um, so, our emphasis really is on on language. Uh, how do we learn from each other? How do we communicate? You know, engineers and artists and designers. We all have a different design means a different thing for everybody. You know, a, re a design review means a different thing for all of this. So we really focus on language. Language is key to understand how we communicate, make sure that nothing gets lost in translation, particularly with the stakeholders, you know, and, and eventually the users, you know, who are we designing this for? So, you know, language, again, enriches our, our trip. Uh, as the more languages we speak, the better this trip is around the world. You know, when we spoke, you know, with people, if you can communicate in their own language, is key. So these are the elements of design that we, we take care to to do in the initial steps of the design process, as well as looking at then this very creative moment, which could last about a week, where we lock ourselves this team in a room, and actually fill the room. You know, with these stickies and, and ideas and sketches and poems and, and words. And, and we always go back to kind of that mission control throughout the project uh, to make sure that we don't leave anything behind. Anyway, after that, it sort of becomes kind of the, the, the normal you know, kind of design process. But eventually, uh, it's the time to do prototypes and 3D modeling and so on. And we work one-on-one. -on -one. We love to work on one-on-one. -on -one. So when I work on the space station, Actually, in the studio, we had a full-scale mock-up of the habitation module of the space station, which was about as long as this uh, stage and about 12 feet in diameter. 
So we had a hangar where we actually lived and constantly manipulated the design to make sure that every square inch was being used in the right way. So I spent about more than 10 years working on the, on the habitation aspects of, of the space station. Uh, this is flying about 300 miles uh, above the Earth. Uh, the space station is our greatest laboratory that we've done it, as, hum as humans. Uh, as Deva mentioned, this is international. The great thing about when we started designing this is that <coughs> we had the experience of Skylab, the first American space station that flew in the early 1970s. And I had the pleasure to work with some of the astronauts, particularly Jerry Carr, a commander of the third mission, spent 90 days in, uh, in orbit. And uh, he was a design critic. He really got into the design and what are all the mistakes that were done and how can we improve this? So he's worked with us in, in many, many uh, of these projects to make sure that we don't make at least the same mistakes over and over again. So you know, going back in history is absolutely critical uh, for the success of design. In many cases, uh, it's impossible uh, because in some of the missions, like going to Mars, we don't really know what it is to live on Mars. So Deva spoke and showed those fantastic videos of people eating, so I had the pleasure of, again, designing the galley for the space station, how people eat, you know, how people, uh, how do we store food, how do we consume it, how do we prepare it, uh, and particularly, uh, the table. The table loses all meaning in space. You know, when you have this gravity, you saw Kelly making his taco, you know, just floating in space. So, um, you know, we kind of disassembled the whole idea of the, of the table and actually came up with this idea of having trays, that trays make the table and actually it allows you to, um, you know, to eat in a community or you can just take the tray and eat by yourself in a different module. But the issue with the tray uh, is that also things fly, fly around, as you saw uh, on the video. So um, we looked at uh, just uh, the ways to restrain things on the, on the tray to make sure things are not floating around or you lose your lunch or, or ends up behind a computer somewhere. Uh, so <laughs> we, we, it, it, this is, uh, we spent a lot of time designing color. We did studies of color and the psychological issues of colors and so on, but NASA really didn't pay much attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we got uh, at the end of the game. Uh, it's really a, a very cluttered uh, environment. Uh, uh, it just changed my whole view. Uh, not too long ago, we were in India, and, uh, and the Indian environment is incredibly cluttered. At, and, uh, and I'm more a minimalist kind of designer. I think everything should be in, in its place and in order. But I realized that if we're gonna spend three years going to Mars, maybe clutter is good because every day is different, things are moving around, and so I'm kind of changing my views on, on what is it that we need to stay and survive for, for long periods of time uh, in space. This is the design for the sleeping quarters. Spent a lot of time working on this, actually. Uh, this is the private space of, of the space station. This is your home. This is where you can actually close the door and leave the rest of the crew behind, your worries behind. It's a place that you might be communicating with people at home. Um, we spent a lot of time designing uh, the, the, the sleeping bag, which actually turned into a garment. You know, we talked about cutting the slits so you actually are working while you're hanging on the, on the wall. This is kind of a glorified telephone booth. Many of you don't even know what that is. But, <laughs> but uh, the idea here is uh, that actually we came up with this idea that since you can't go and paint your own color for this thing, uh, you, you actually uh, can change the color of the panels, the acoustical panels. So if you look at the evolution in the last 15, 16 years, the astronauts actually have this door, this sleeping quarter change colors. You know, so there's, if, there's photographs of, of sleeping quarters of different colors. That's again Samantha Cristoforetti, the Italian a, a astronaut. This is one of the latest missions in, in, in her cool you know, green uh, uh, Italian looking uh, sleeping bag. So, you know, we looked at acoustics, and it's a tremendous amount of work and, and working with scientists and psychologists, you know, to really try to understand, you know, what are the effects of all of these things in astronauts. But astronauts are very particular, so they can put up with a lot of things that you, we uh, mere humans can't. So these are the next steps. I mean, really, we're going back to the moon, uh, if nothing else, to really experiment, to really learn about how we're going to live 
on Mars, how we're going to explore Mars. Uh, this is the project that took me, um, you know, in my kind of new career and to space. Um, this, this was my thesis that ended up at the Air and Space Museum and the Smithsonian and uh, really gave me a great boost uh, to continue with this and this commitment to, you know, the vertical migration of man. And, uh, and, but we don't know much about this. Uh, on the moon, we have 12 astronauts that touched the moon and never lived there, really. Went there for a very, very short time. So uh, it's an environment that is new to us. We need to explore it. We need to learn uh, with this, uh, uh, the same thing with, with Mars. You know, the moon is very rich you know, in, in the regolith, has a lot of glass and basalt and a lot of materials that we can use, oxygen that we can use for for the atmosphere and, and building materials. So we need to start learning how to use the local materials to, to build, to actually make things on the moon, particularly, or on Mars, particularly now that we have 3D printing. You know, we're talking about 3D printing parts and, and not taking parts with us, 3D printing the environment, 3D, 3D printing our, our, our environment, our, 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 our architecture. So it's, uh, the, my, Project, my latest project is really to convince NASA, I did this under a NASA funding, uh, the National Institute for Advanced Concepts at NIAC, uh, funded us to explore uh, ideas of how we actually explore planets and, and, and the surface of the moon or Mars. So I came up with this idea that we need uh, uh, rovers, pressurized rovers, rather than building a base that actually allows you to only uh, uh, explore a perimeter around, uh, around that base. Now, if we have this, sort of like your Winnebago, uh, where you actually can travel and then you can be picked up and then another crew picks it up and then moves it and, and continue to have hands-on exploration. And maybe this is the way we, we end up going to Mars, explore the surface of Mars as well. Um, and I, this is rigged up with inflatable structures that when they comes out, you have a larger, um, a larger space to work, just like the Winnebago, that you can expand it. Uh, and, uh, because the spaces are very, very tight. And um, so this is sort of the scale of the, of the space inside that rover. And uh, one of the main issues on the moon and maybe it might be in Mars is that the, the soil, the regolith on, 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 Mar on, on the moon is um, maybe we're allergic to it. You know, some astronauts show some allergies and it might be toxic. Yeah, so we're looking at creating a, a, a kind of a, a a laminar flow effect of air picking up the air and this grid on the floor, you know, accelerating the gravity. Given that the gravity on the moon is one sixth of the one here on Earth, uh, we have to look at ways of how to, you know, contain that, how to get it out of the local atmosphere so we don't breathe it in. So this is small space, you know, looking at seats where. You know, astronauts might live and work, you know, for long periods of time, maybe three months, uh, in, a, in a space like this small, with the uh, ability also to go outside and explore, uh, you know, and when when they're stopped. So, um, this brings me to the biosuit. This is Davis' invention. Uh, this has been one of our greatest journeys. Uh, uh, we've been working for over a decade on this. Uh, this project came about in our circumnavigation. They were, uh, we crossed from Australia to South Africa. We spent a month alone uh, crossing the Indian Ocean. And uh, when the weather allowed, Deva would pull out the computer in the cockpit and, and start talking about all this stuff of how we need mobility to explore the mo you know, moon and Mars. And you know, came up with this idea through research that we can create the atmospheric pressure directly on the body you know, with mechanical counter pressure. That means kind of a big stretched heart suit that contains, uh, applies the pressure of this atmosphere directly on our skin. Very different than the picture on the right on the, on the, uh, you know, the suits that we have today, which actually have a, is a big balloon and has gas inside it, and it actually has an atmosphere. Very rigid to move, very difficult to bend down, very cumbersome to, to see from. So very hard to explore on this thing. So, you know, Deva's dream, and, and, and I, I I've been the designer on this, is always pushing us to make this thinner and stronger and, and make it a true second skin, almost invisible, but actually keeping the, 
the atmospheric pressure in every square millimeter of the body. Not an easy challenge, but we've been working at it. And lately, we've been working on the helmet, actually, of this thing, of how it attaches to the suit. The big difference here is actually we're trying to create more visibility and it, because the suits today, you know, you look down and you end up looking inside of your suit because it has these big rings. And the idea here is more like a motorcycle helmet where the, you know, where the motorcyclist actually can move around and look and see exactly what your, your, where your task is. So we're looking at ways of connecting it and, 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 and creating devices and mechanisms to do that. So we're working on that. And last but not least, this is a project that we just got the second phase of it. We started working with Deva, and now she cannot work on this project given her position at NASA. But the team you know, with MIT and, uh, and actually Dainese, a company in Italy that designs uh, airbags for a motorcycle riders, saving lives in people doing extreme sports. This is, uh, uh, so we studied the astronaut. We do a tremendous amount of interviews with astronauts and how does it feel, how, you know, whether you're this small or this big, you know, it, it affects you differently, the interaction with the spacesuit. The astronaut has been getting uh, hurt. You know, you can see here, you know, areas of, of problems where they've been injured in the shoulder and in the injured in the neck, um, you know, and the hips. So we're creating a whole uh, system of uh, passive and non-passive, you know, uh, inflatable, actually, pads that kind of lock you into place. So you, you get into the suit, you can inflate this thing, and kind of locks you in key places on the, on the suit uh, so you don't get hurt by the bearings and the structure, the hard structure of the suit, while you're mostly while you're training. Uh, these guys train underwater in the swimming pools. Uh, and actually uh, doing zero gravity maneuvers. So basically, you might be upside down, upside down, but uh, with gravity. So uh, we're trying to eliminate this by creating this very active, inflatable, smart uh, system. So we're in the middle of this, and it's really been, you know, a really fascinating journey to to work on on that. So anyway, uh, just to conclude, really the journey of design. Uh, my, that's one of the journeys that that I that I take, uh, they have taken in my life, but it really is about the crew, the team members, who do you hang out with, who, do the, who are the people that you're gonna exchange ideas, you know, the creative minds that you, that you, you, know, you put around uh, the table when you, where you're trying to come up with you know, new solutions, um, and then where no ideas are bad ideas when you start this thing, and never forget that about them because it's like this biosuit that it could have, you know, many people at the beginning have said you can't do it, and now we're accomplishing it. Uh, so, you know, really that perseverance, that commitment to design is absolutely critical. So to conclude, this is, you know, one of my motives, you know, so uh, a journey really is uh, a journey of transformation. Every day we transform ourselves. Every decision that we make every day transforms ourselves, you know, keeps us going on this journey, and uh, this is, the way that uh, you know, we keep our dream alive, you know, pursue, pursue our dreams, and really pursue happiness. So design your life away. <laughs> Thank you.